think the service I, I, I've seen more than any other band uh, going into like, I'd say late 80s, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and then you guys went on that little hiatus. So, but at that point, I think I, I seen you guys about 14 times. <laughs> so I was, uh, yeah, man, I, I was, I was just wherever you guys are playing, I tried to get, I tried to go. So poser. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very excited that you guys are, are back and playing again. That's awesome. Um, so, uh, I am, uh, I do have tickets to see you in April here in Jersey at the stone pony. So I'll be seeing, catching you guys there. In Asbury Park. Yes, legendary Asbury Park. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, how's it feel to be back playing again? Oh, I don't know. In what respect? Physically? <laughs> <laughs> mentally? Emotionally? Uh, how about mentally? <laughs> how about what? Mentally. Emotionally. <laughs> oh, shoot. I just dropped something. Um, right now, I'm... Uh, Mentally, huh? That's a hard question to. These are hard questions, guys. <laughs> um, Inquiring minds want to know. Mentally, it's it's worrisome. You know, with the state of the way things are. Right. Okay. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's stimulating to be playing that um, that music. You know, it's very fast, very loud, and very physical. Yeah. Um, yeah, mentally, uh, you know, there's there's quite a bit of different uh, sort of questions in the air as far as uh, COVID compliance and right. Um, you know, um, it's it's a it's a bit like uh waiting for the other shoe to drop or looking over your shoulder constantly um we were supposed to go out at 20 on in 2020 uh of course the virus hit right so we waited a year and then it seemed to linger on into 2021 um we just started in september we played a few dates some festival dates uh, riot fest and punk rock bowling and right. Um, and everything went fine. Outdoor gigs. Uh, we we played some some shows um, on the East Coast. Everything seemed to go fine. We we finished the tour, and then about a, a half of our band came down with, well, me myself, the drummer, and um, uh, two of the crew members came down with coronavirus. Oh. and so. You know, mentally, it's yeah, it's it's like uh, you know, if if one person gets sick during the middle of a tour, then the dates get canceled, you lose the money, or it gets postponed, and uh, you know, the the fans have to pivot as well. So it's a hard time to be uh, it, it's a hard time to be doing this, and it it's not so much fun, you know what I mean, because uh. You know, I mean, rock and roll has been getting less and less fun as far as the, the backstage antics and follies that, that happen. You know, uh, I don't mean to sound like an old man, but like I, you know, I've been touring for like 40 years yeah. <laughs> and uh, a lot of things have changed over the course of that time. And so now with this new whole element, you know, the virus, it's we're sequestered, of, you know, into, you know, private area and can't intermingle with people or have guests backstage. And uh, you have to just be very, very careful. It's not just like be careful because somebody's going to be, phone, you know, filming you on their cell phone and putting whatever it is you're saying and doing on social media or YouTube. All right. it's, it's, uh, it's even we have to take even more care now. Yeah, you know, I didn't really think about that. Um, you, I mean, you, you, you know, you guys, you play with all these different bands and you want to be friends and stuff and, and you got to you gotta be careful of that. Yeah, I didn't think about that. That's Well, you want to have fun. Yeah. You know, you don't want it to all be work. And, you know, it's a, there's a weird juxtaposition between 
being up on stage in front of a thousand people or so freaking out. And then, you know, the rest of the time you're basically in a submarine, you know, with, you know, six other people, yeah. wow. including your crew. Yeah. Xander, with, with, with having to distance yourself like that, to your point, do you, do you embrace social media? Do you embrace those types of ways to interact with your fans since you can't, um, like you said, in a live capacity? Well, I mean, what choice do I have? Right. Yeah, sure. You know what I mean? It, it's just like, uh, it's a way to promote whatever it is that you're you're doing. For me, it's like em, embracing it is like, uh, I, I don't embrace it necessarily as a lifestyle, but I do embrace it as a marketing tool, you know? And uh, here we are on Zoom, you know, the technology's gotten to the point where it's like, I can connect with you guys, you know, in my car in Los Angeles while you're sitting in what looks to be like one of you guys' kitchen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is our studio. Yeah. 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 Big Profes bucks. Big bucks. Studio. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, I guess, you know, hey, man, any question these days, you know, seems like it used to be there would be complicated questions and then you'd come up with a simple answer. Now it's just like people ask you a simple answer and it's a complicated, I mean, a simple question. And it's a complicated answer. Um, so, you know, 40 years of, of the Circle Jerks as a band. And, uh, I mean, you've been with them for most of it. Uh, Since 1984. 84. I'm still the new guy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who's playing drums with you guys now? There's a man named Joey Castillo. Okay. All right. And uh, Joey is... Uh, He's got the punk rock pedigree. He played with uh, Wasted Youth. Oh. Um, and uh, he played with our, our friend Glenn Danzig for a, quite some time. Oh, okay, cool. And uh, was with a very popular band called Queens of the Stone Age for about 10 years. Oh, yeah. All right. But, uh, you know, he's a guy, I guess they, they say he's kind of an animal. You know, I mean, it's a pleasure to play with the guy. I never have to look over my shoulder as far as that's concerned gotcha. um I, I can always count on his him, him to be there musically right you guys um, are just shelling you know so that's good yeah you know i mean one of the blessings i guess of of, of covid is, is that uh we as a rhythm section were able to get together over the course of a year so it wasn't just the audition process hurry up and and learn the songs rehearse and get out on the road we actually got a chance to to sort of like know the all the the subtleties and nuances of one another's style styles and uh, playing, um, and so it's kind of now more sounds like a like a seasoned band, which is the way it's supposed to sound. Sure. Um, and uh, we're able to kind of turn on a dime with with one another if need be. Gotcha. Okay. So when you're playing the festivals. Obviously, you're on a truncated timetable, right? You have, what, 40 minutes set? Yeah, I mean, if it's a union show, you, they set them up, you knock them down and move to the next town. Right. Uh, so for you guys touring when it's, you know, you're headlining, you know, you're playing, what, an hour? Uh, I mean, you guys have more than enough material. Um, is it, you know, how do you decide when it's only a 40 minute set versus a, a, a 50 minute set, 50 minutes for you guys is 10, <laughs> 10 more songs, you know? Um, well, honestly, it's like, there's probably, we can play about 33 songs in the course of an hour. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I'll say from my perspective, honestly, it's a lot easier to play an hour long set than it is to play a 40 minute set because you're you're allowing your muscles to to sort of like uh you know uh wind out and you know get used to all that downstroking at 200 yeah. beats per minute i was gonna say you 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 play downstroke pretty much the whole time right you don't uh yeah it, it, it's a certain it's a it's a specialized sort of way of of playing that that not many 
it's kind of a lost art we're we're yeah. like cavemen or something that are sort of like yeah. you know just stomping around we don't know we're extinct yet but we do the specialized sort of like uh you know thing that that not a lot of bands are familiar with especially at the speeds that we're playing right um and uh so that being said back to the question it's like a, during a 40 minute set what ends up happening is we cut out some of the, 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 the you know we we go from either fast or lightning fast you know what i mean so right. we cut out some of the fast songs which makes it even more difficult to play a 40 minute set because they're all lightning fast songs gotcha right all right just trying to squeeze in as much as you can yeah okay oh well just you know just playing you know yeah <laughs> it's like being dragged on a rocket ship and you're hanging outside on a rope or something yeah, so it's, it's 10 pounds in a five pound bag <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah um i i would say as as a fan i i i listen a lot and I think about every six months I go back and I, and I watch the, the House of Blues uh, video. Um, I love that video, man. You guys were so on that night. And the mix in that video is fantastic. You can really hear your playing. And, uh, and, and the drums, the kick drums in that are just wonderful. It's a, it's a great set. The only thing I would say is there wasn't a lot of, I don't think you did much of anything from, from Wonderful or yeah yeah well it's funny you should say that because it's like uh you know uh i put a lot of sweat equity into those first three records right and you know it's like when you have a lead singer and you're trying to figure out a set list if you say we're going to play this song and he doesn't want to sing it well then you're not going to be playing that song right exactly <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it's like we're playing the songs that, that uh, you know, and plus the fact that these were supposed to be anniversary tours for, for some of those uh, those records. So, right, right. And they kick ass. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think the first tour I saw you guys on was probably the wonderful tour. Um, and uh, subsequently, pretty much everything after that. Um, you know, the, the, the departure of w the sound in the band and how you guys evolved into where wonderful and then, uh, what was, uh, uh five was after that? Six? Six. 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 VI, yeah. Six. <laughs> it was actually our fifth album, but yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, you know that that sound really evolved in wonderful and six and, and then the uh when you guys came back and did the uh what was it, Ab abnormalities yeah so and that that album had a completely different sound altogether uh that mix was you know the guitar sound was really different than that you know um huh maybe you'll have to blame nico bolas on that right. guy <laughs> was, that, was that uh was that major label? Was it did that was that on? Yeah, that was our first major label. Uh, uh, day that was our major label debut. Right, Mercury Record. Mercury. Our, our Mercury Records, and I think they were a little surprised, you know, because they're it was during the whole kind of uh, Green Day offspring rancid, you know, resurgent uh, uh, interest in in punk. Right, but what they what they failed to recognize is that we're the pioneers of uh, you're one of the pioneers of hardcore yeah. right. punk. Yeah. So I think they were thinking they were going to get like Dookie or like a bunch pop of punk. harmonies and yeah, they thought you, you know pop punk and and you guys gave them what you guys do, you know? Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna. They were like, wait a minute, this is kind of rough and scary, and like. <laughs> What are we supposed to do with this? <laughs> yeah, they didn't know how to market that one. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Go yeah. fuck yourself. How about that? <laughs> the kids didn't get it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, I don't I, know if the kids, the kids probably got it. I think it was the the label executives probably didn't get it. Oh, yeah, they didn't get it. Yeah. So yeah. based on that, what were you saying, Xander, about how the, the label thought that they were getting, you know, pop punk or whatever, how do you feel about the sound of punk as it is now? Do you like some of these pop punk bands? You know, I mean, punk was 
based upon raging against the machine and not giving a shit and stuff like that. Do you feel that these bands of today are doing punk justice? Do you want me to be honest or do you want me to like sugarcoat it? <laughs> oh, honestly, go ahead. <laughs> honestly, I really don't listen to that music. No? Okay. No, and uh, I'm not trying to be a punk rock cop or something like that and say, this is punk and this is not punk and huh. you're guilty of not being punk. I could really give a fuck like if you're punk or not. And that's why I am so punk. Right. Because of my <laughs> shitty attitude and my all inclusiveness. It's like, why should I fucking care? Yeah. Like if you're if you want to like, you know, do this or you want to do that, you know, you're pop punk, you know. Uh I don't care. <laughs> and, and that's what's good. I think that's what's good about seeing you guys on the festivals because there's a good mix of some classic old school original bands uh yeah. on some of these festivals i have punk rock bowling you know you know there's not too many new punk bands on, on some of these festivals you know yeah um so i'm looking at my jewel pod seeing how much i got left i dropped my jewel underneath my car seat okay <laughs> it'd be a problem at some point i might start crawling around all right <laughs> um, um no but there you know honestly like and i've always said this i don't care what kind of music you play if the craft is good and the musicianship is good and you know uh i i and you put your heart and soul into it, it's fine by me. I, I like good music. It doesn't matter what it is. And you've been uh, in other, you've been in so many different types of bands that it's not like you just play hardcore your whole life. I mean, you know. No, uh, I, this is outside of my, my job with the Circle Jerks. I, 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 I've played so many different genres of music and I'm a trained musician and uh, lived with my jazz teacher for a year and, and went to music school after that. Oh. So people used to make fun of me for, for that fact. But the fact of the matter is, is that when the Circle Jerks needed a bass player uh, and they say, learn three songs, I learned all three records in, in a night <laughs> and came in and was ready to go on the road in two weeks. So you can make, they can make all the fun they want of right. me, but it's like, it got me the job, you know, and it's gotten me into many studio sessions and yeah. scoring films, uh, you know, composing music for films. It got me into playing with, uh, you know, Joe Strummer and scoring films with him and touring and, you know, making records with him and being his musical director. Wow. So make all the fun you want of having a musical education. I, I, I don't think it's hurt me at all. I think it's a wonderful thing. I mean, you know, you're a pro musician. It's, it's yeah. you know, uh, and if you're going to be a pro to have those kind of chops, yeah. it's huge to, to be able to go to different genres. You know, I mean, I know when you did the uh, what, Thelonious Monks, I, I bought that Monster. album. Uh, I bought it because you were on it. You know? Oh, thank you. Yeah. I was like, whoa, Xander's in this. I got to check this out. I bought the record, you know. Well, um, the funny thing is, is that. Yeah, Thelonious Monsters. So yeah. The way that I was doing it back in the day is the way the kids are doing it now. You know, like uh, there's a bunch of like they, they call them like mercenaries back then where it's like you're in four different bands and you, you're, you know, playing constantly and playing all sorts of different music. But that's the way the kids are doing it now so that they can kind of like, you know, scratch out a living from it. Yeah, it's their career. It's, yeah, it's their career. And it's like, if you're going to have a career, it's like, well, I want to be a brain surgeon. Well, you got to go to medical school to do that. You know what I mean? And it's like, if you want to be a true professional, which, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the guys, God bless them, have gone, gone a long way on just doing punk rock and it's making a lot of money and, and, you know, you don't need much of an education to, to do it. But you certainly need to have some stamina and some physical, you know, uh, prowess and some uh, finesse, you know, to actually accurately play at those aggressively at those speeds. Yeah. So that's where I found merit in, in, in punk rock was like 
this is a is, is a physically exacting job if it's done right yeah yeah and and you know i i i always cringe when i hear people say oh they don't know how to play their instruments listen there's a lot of great musicians in punk music uh you know that that, that bothers me to no end when i hear people say that and put it down yeah you know i mean there's a lot of great musicians in this well Tell your fans, or I'll tell your fans, come out and see for yourself. Yeah. You know, and it's like, if you know, like, uh, say, for instance, you're watching the rhythm section of, of the Circle Jerks work out up there, and you look at that drummer, you know, and what I have to do to, to be locked with that drummer, it's an incredible, it's an incredibly exacting job. And a lot of the chops that uh, originally the Lucky Lair had and brought to the table were from his love of of, of jazz drumming jazz, and right? uh, yes. you know Buddy Rich and yeah. you know man now those guys can really drum yeah and Joey's yeah. one of those guys man it's it's just it's a very very uh, rhythm section oriented band you wouldn't know because you're you're watching you know Keith Morris he's explosive and yeah. you know Greg's hopping around up there you know doing his his little little bunny hops and stuff like that but. <laughs> it's the rhythm section that's holding down the band as yeah, those guys yeah, yeah listen as i'm a bass player too so i'll always stand i'm always front and center there so that's what i, I want to watch you i want to watch the bass player i want to watch that symmetry with the drummer and, and just you know be able to watch you well, guys kind of get. i want to clarify for your audience I'm not a big dumb bass player. I just play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Xander, do you do you feel um, record, you know, scoring like you said, films and, and whatnot? Do you feel more of a um, uh, a creative freedom doing those versus you know studio sessions with you know recording with uh, bands and whatnot? Well, I mean, if I'm writing an original score, yeah, if I'm if I'm doing something that, uh, you know, uh, requires me to, you know, sort of just fit into whatever mold that, that I'm being put into. Well, of course, that answers your question. You know, uh, I also am embarking on a solo career and have an album that's dropping Mar in uh, early March. Oh, awesome. Um, and, uh, which is. Uh, I think as a result of playing as long as I have, as loud and fast as I have, this album is gentle and slow and very musical, and, uh, and, and there's no anger in it. It's okay. more, more core feelings All right. getting to the bottom of the anger. Um, is this the soft side of Xander? Is, is that what it is? <laughs> no, this is, the real, this is the real Xander. This is the, the Xander uh in the shadows you know <laughs> um not, oh, not, not the Xander the title, in the, do i hear the title of the album in the shadows <laughs> no the album is called song about songs all right cool awesome and uh it'll be available uh on disc and uh lp and streaming i think uh march 4th awesome i'll, I'll be on the lookout for it yeah yeah there's some videos that i'm putting up and some singles on youtube and you know had you guys done your homework you would have known that yeah <laughs> yeah um, that, it's the budget it's, i it's, told you there's, there's, there's no production. how much of a budget is it to fucking flip through youtube and, and see what i'm doing these days uh, see this is the thing you know and i don't mean to sound like bitch about it but it's like you know, I'm the type of person that's always striving for his potential, that never wants to reach his potential. But a lot of people will say, well, you, your potential is bass player in the circle jerks. And I say, no, that's not necessarily true. And your potential was, you know, when you were a younger man. And I say, no, that's not necessarily the way things go. For people who have not necessarily achieved their potential, they can continue to, to come up with, uh, fresh new ideas and uh innovate and um you know explore different you know parts of themselves and you know musically and present that you know mm -hmm. so i would uh i would um if i were a fan of the circle jerks i would be interested in seeing what what this other side of me is oh absolutely absolutely and and 
obviously, you know, in doing the, in the, 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 the scores and everything that you did and, and the work that you did with Joe Strummer, um, I, I think that if anyone takes the time to listen to that stuff would understand that you are a pro musician. That is, yeah. that is who you are, you know? So. Yeah. And also that I've actually only, I'm, I'm a guitar player and a player of multi-stringed instruments. I've only actually played bass with the circle jerks and the weirdos. Right. But because of, of, of their higher profile, that's kind of like what a lot of people know me for. Right. It's what they know you for. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's talk about the other side. You're acting, right? You've been in a couple movies, right? Uh, is that something well, that was uh, kind of an accident, but then okay, I, I, I was going to ask to see that. Was that by design? Is that something you really wanted to do, or was it just you fell into it? I think that that comes from my uh, ability to not give a fuck. You know, it's like uh, I've always kind of you know been a class clown and uh, you know a, an attention seeker, so. It didn't bother me to, you know, all I had to do was read the lines and, you know, make the faces and hit my marks and stuff. <laughs> um, it didn't bother me that there were 60 crew members standing by watching me do it. You know, if, if, if I played in front of thousands of people, I don't I don't get necessarily shy when when the red light comes on and the camera is filming. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you did Repo Man first, right? That's kind of where you mm -hmm. OK. Um, so how did you go from Repo Man to being in the Circle Jerks? Because that's basically where the career went at that well, time. Well, honestly, uh, I, I pursued a little bit of, a, of an acting career after that and had a little bit of luck and, you know, was in a, a few more uh, movies with Alex and some various movies with some people that uh, had contacted me. But I went out there and... and auditioned for some films and got into some cattle calls and stuff like that and it's just like you know it's like they they basically after you're done they're like thank you and there's a bunch of other people that look like you sitting out in the lobby waiting to do the same thing you just did and you're just got on the street and you feel like you got like fucked up the ass by a hundred mountain gorillas or something <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean it's just like, um, sorry, I hope there's no kids listening, but it really wasn't for me to, to go out there and kind of whore myself like that. So if somebody wants me to be in their movie, call me up or DM me on social media or whatever, but I'm not going to fucking audition. Yeah. <laughs> it's... I'm your man. Put me in front of the camera. I don't give a fuck, but <laughs> that seems to be the theme of the day. Yeah. <laughs> um but at any rate how did i go from that um like i said i was pursuing uh you know doing some more acting and um a car pulled up i was living in a 10 by 10 office space on um hollywood v boulevard um i think between ivar and cosmo if that means anything to anybody and uh no phone, no TV, you know, no bathroom, no kitchen, hundred bucks a month living in a 10 by 10 office space with a brick wall outside of my window. And somebody pulled up in a car and said, Hey man, the circle jerks are looking for a bass player. And I said, well, why the fuck are you talking to me? <laughs> he said, well, you look like you could use a gig. And I said, okay. So I called Greg Hudson up. He said, learn three, these three songs. I said, fuck you man i'm gonna learn all three fucking records and come in and you know blow away the competition and so i did and you know i i accidentally kind of landed in the circle jerks gotcha. do you <laughs> to remember, be honest what were the yeah. do you remember what the three songs he told you to learn were i think it was probably like uh shit hits the fan coup d'etat and wild in the streets all right okay. the hits all right yeah. So, I mean, they were in the movie. They had that short little cameo in the movie. Uh, at that point, did you meet them or, or you still didn't know? Uh, I did. I said hello to them on the set and they walked right by me. <laughs> little did they know. Yeah, right. You know, what the future holds, you know. 
Uh, it's a funny world, you know. Yeah. You, you just don't know. There's windows open, and you know, unless you're ready to jump in, then you just don't know. Like that actor is our bass player. How'd that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I, you know. I can't account for what's going on in the world, especially right now. To me, it's like I've been, you know, I'm a wise old man now. I've been searching for the answer and I've I've come up with the the answer is there is no answer, you know. And, uh, you know, if there's karma, if uh, if there is karma, I must have been a really bad person in my my last lifetime or something (laughs) like that. But uh, I just believe it's all randomness, chaos. You know what I mean? And so that being said, you know, like I said, windows open and it's like, if you're, if you're prepared for the opportunity, jump in the window, just say yes and be overly prepared when those opportunities come along. And that's how I built my career. You know, somebody said, uh, you know, I'd never acted a day in my life before repo, man. They said, well, you want to, you know, would you want to be in this movie? I said, yes. And then I learned how to act when the camera went on. Uh, you know, somebody said, you want to be in the circle jerks? I said, yes. I'd never played punk rock in my life. I just learned how to do it. You know, uh, jump into the fire. And if there's an urgent necessity, that's a really great motivator. So nothing's going to hold you back. No, if you believe you could do anything, you can kind of learn how to do it. And especially these days, you just go on YouTube and learn how to do it. But uh, back in those days, you just had to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> so like the next Tony Robbins, the new uh, inspirational speaker, you could do a tour of that possibly. <laughs> I mean, I probably could, yeah. you know, but I will say this about that. Unless you have so, if you're prepared or not, if you're not overly prepared to do what you're being asked to do, which means that you're going to stand in the consequences of of the decisions that you've made, and you know when when the record button goes down and you haven't you know, learned how to play your instrument or you know they start filming and you haven't had a lot of time, like you know, kind of like. I don't know, being characters and, you know, doing your, you know, acting out, you know, and being an extrovert, you might have some problems. So it's not for everybody. Yeah. You know, true. So uh, with the new uh, music that you have coming out, is this something that you, you played all the instruments? Do you have any no. musicians with you or you just, because I know you play multiple instruments. So is this just all? Yeah. I didn't even play bass. Uh, um, the guy who produced the album, Gus Seifert, uh, played bass on the album. Okay. Um, he plays with uh, Roger Waters right now. Okay. And uh, when I found him, he was playing with Nora Jones. Wow. And he's a, he's probably one of the best bass players in the world and a fantastic producer. Um, um, the guy, so there was a guy playing uh, keyboards Jake Blanton, who plays with Brandon Flowers and the Killers, wow. and uh, Josh Adams playing drums, who who plays, uh, I think he played with Jenny Lewis, and I think he's playing with the Fruit Bats or somebody like that. But these guys were all incredible musicians, so we did it to tape to limit our options, you know, to sort of like, uh, you know, just rehearse the song once and take the best out of one or two takes. Um, like, and I, like I said, being overly prepared, that's not for everybody. If you can't, if you can't, you know, perform under those circumstances, it's going to sound like shit, but I had the best musicians with me and I sang and played guitar at the same time and recorded something like 10, 10 tracks over the course of four days, basic wow. tracks for that and did a couple of overdubs and, uh, mixed it in the next two days so the album was and when you hear the album you're you're gonna go there's no way that that these guys did that you know because it sounds like we took our time and yeah um so yeah it's all material that you've been writing for a few years or just and you said i finally want to record this or just like you just said Lynn, i got this stuff i want to do right now well i don't know if you guys know this but you know uh 
I, I was doing another project with Sean Wheeler uh, called Sean and Xander. And we were doing kind of an Americana thing, uh, acoustic thing. And so we recorded a couple of records and we're going out there and playing as a duo and opening bands for, for punk rock bands like Social Distortion and X and uh, Flogging Molly. Uh, we toured a lot with Mark Lanigan. But I was kind of in preparation for for doing this, you know, over the course of the, the 10, you know, 12 years that the Circle Jerks were on hiatus. Right. OK. All right. Cool. Um, new Circle Jerks music? Yes. No. Maybe. Well, you know, at this point, John's, we're like a, we're kind of mo more like a legacy act. I mean, we could right. do new music. Right. Um, and going back to earlier in the conversation, but the people that, that are, are interested in when we reached our peak may not be as interested in the new music that we're making now that we're old, old grumpy old punks. Right. You know, um, I would love to make a new record. We'll see how it goes. Right. But we're, we're basically like a legacy act. So, you know, it's, it's as if, uh, I don't know, like the Eagles or uh, the Rolling Stones or yeah, you get up there, you yeah. play all your all your hits and what you're known for, and yeah. The next Why one. do we got to write a new record? Yeah, yeah. Do you feel when you're on tour on some of these um, the, these festivals or whatnot? Do you feel that you still get the accolade from the newer bands that actually you know that looked up to you? Uh, influential? Do you feel like that energy from them? Like, holy shit, I'm seeing my idols now? Yes. Uh, they should. They yeah. should. I mean, yeah. like you said, I mean, you guys paved the way for a lot of this music at the, you know, you've been doing it for so many years and here's these kids coming up now, you know, and they have it easy. They have everything streaming. They have everything's accessible to kids now i mean you you pull up your phone you can listen to every goddamn song you want where you guys were doing it back in the day you had diy and street teams and tape trading and shit like that so it's a it's yeah a culture shock <laughs> well i think it's a litmus test on you know if somebody doesn't recognize that or acknowledge that then it's like uh i don't know they're a fucking asshole. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like I forget who the band was. I remember a couple of years ago at one of these festivals, there was a band that that uh, was giving Brian Baker a hard time about some shit. And Brian is like, you know, one of considered one of the nicest fucking guys in the world, right? And I mean, you're gonna you're gonna give shit to Brian Baker, really? You know? Um, well, I don't think that anybody really deserves anything you know i don't have a sense of entitlement about it but i i do think that you know if one was courteous and one was intelligent enough they would treat another person any person with dignity and respect right. so that being said you know i i don't think that i'm entitled to it but we have done a lot of hard work and laid the groundwork down uh uh, you know did, did a lot of the heavy lifting for for you know what, what what came after us yeah we laid on the fence so you could crawl over our back so <laughs> fucking <laughs> recognize yeah. you know i like that analogy um, good. uh joe strummer is probably my biggest musical idol so what was it like uh, for you to work with him well i mean i say this you know pretty pretty often to people who ask me about that you know my the greatest gift of of working with Joe Strummer was working with Joe Strummer, you know, um, the the man, the, the personality, because uh, you know a lot of people that that I talked to that have had any kind of uh, personal experience with the guy knew that he was uh, a real gentleman and a and a people's person. You know what I mean? Um, that being said, uh, you know um, he was a uh, probably one of the most generous and, and down to earth people that I'd ever worked with. And we had thousands and thousands of hours of, of great conversations and hang times. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of like what I took away from Joe was his, 
his ability to make himself available, his gratitude, you know, towards the fans and making himself available, you know, to um, either sneak them through the back door if that they didn't have a ticket or uh, hang out and take some photos and sign whatever they wanted to sign and take some photos with them after the show. Um, and just be generally being a gentleman to, you know, the, the people that supported him. Um, that also mixed with a sort certain curiosity for all things hu human, humanity. And, you know, uh, he was just a, you know, like I think curiosity was, was Joe's God, which, which also made him a, you know, sort of a very, very open person, uh, you know, to be curious about people, no matter whether they were famous or whether they were not, you know, somebody that he didn't know or cultures or uh, geography or music. And I'm the same way. And I think Joe saw that in, in, in me as well, kind of, kind of kindred spirits in that. Um, and I learned a lot from him about, you know, uh, just, just being a nice guy and, and saying yes and um, taking the time to, uh, to talk to people and letting them have their dignity and respecting, you know, all humans equally. Hmm. So, yeah, it, it now, see, now you just mean, you know, as my musical idol, now he's even bigger because <laughs> now to find out he was that kind of a man, you know? I mean, well, yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons why he's on the plaques. I think not, not only for uh, the great music that he made and, you know, the, the innovation that they made in, in, um, you know, in punk rock, but if you listen to their, you know, like, uh, but, but for the person that he was, yeah, you know, and his, his philosophy and his ideology. Uh, for me, he, he's on the, the Mount Rushmore of punk. Uh, right. You know, is he, would you say he's on your Mount, Mount Rushmore and who would be the others? Let's, let's... He's my, he's on my Mount Rushmore of, of, uh, people that I've encountered in my life that that treated me fairly and uh treated me with dignity and respect you know and of course you know you can't deny the musicality and the uh the power of 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 uh his lyrics yeah the lyrics and stuff like that but that's to me I I meet a lot of people who are are super talented and a lot of people would say well you should have kissed Joe's ass more well the truth of the matter is, is if I would have kissed Joe's ass, he would have never respected me. All right. You know what I mean? And Joe treated me like a peer where I've seen a lot of people that were not as talented as I am that have uh, tried to uh, belittle me and, and uh, you know, uh, be competitive with me. And the fact of the matter is Joe wasn't competitive. He wins. Yeah. I'm not competitive. Because the truth of the matter is, I've already won. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm the best version of myself that I can be. And that's it. Game over. <laughs> awesome, man. That's great. Um, for uh, as far as musically, what, what are you listening to now? Any, any bands? Uh, nothing. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Is he old school? Do you go old school? Do you just put on the classics or, you know? No, I'm listening to the buzzing of my floor fan and, right. uh, <laughs> you know, the incandescent light and uh, the wind outside. There you go. <laughs> no, you know, like people ask me that question and I don't mean to sound like a dick or anything, but it's like, would you ask a magician to reveal his, his magic tricks? Oh, hell no. <laughs> well, but don't listen to ask me what I'm listening to. <laughs> we'll strike you from the record. <laughs> uh, oh, you know what I wanted to ask you about the the uh, the House of Blues concert. Um, mm -hmm. Who were the two young ladies dancing on the side of the stage? <laughs> oh, that's funny. You should ask because one of those ladies, the the redhead, the five foot. 10 redhead was my fiance at the time okay um and he made it 
it made it almost like more human in a sense. You know, to have yeah, it's kind of weird. I was kind of wondering about her friend. We were all very, very high. Okay. I mean, uh, and her friend, I, I guess, just took it upon herself to just start kind of like dancing further and further out onto the stage. Yeah. And I was just kind of like, oh, okay. I don't know if she's aware. We were, we were so we'd all done a bunch of smack, dude. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> At the time, I was a heroin act. I'm I'm 16 years plus sober now, but uh, congratulations. You know, at the time, I was a I was a terrible uh, junkie. So those two girls, yeah, one was my running partner slash fiance, okay. and the other one was her girlfriend, and we all like were fucking wasted out of our minds. Yeah, there was there was points where they came really close to being, you know almost right in your your playing space but it was great to watch it was like man it makes it kind of it was it was kind of fun to watch you know the people were enjoying it like that uh other yeah. than what the crowd was doing you know so um, yeah and you know that being said you know to reveal that that i was that high and still <laughs> playing with that kind of energy and not missing a note i think oh, that's, that's you, you, pretty extraordinary testament to my talent <laughs> no, you you killed it. You guys sound great on that video. At one point, that uh, I, I guess they, they they had it streaming as a CD or, or release on Amazon Music and stuff, but it's not there anymore because it was never released as an album, uh, mm. just a video. But it was for a little while. It was it was streaming. Uh, uh, on you know on streaming services so i don't know what happened with that but uh you know that's why i go back and i, and I watch it because i want to hear i want to hear you know because i the set was great uh you guys sounded great it was just like man like you're at the top of your game that night you know oh thanks yeah and uh, well it's good to hear i don't i don't feel like i was but oh no that was yeah that, that was really good so uh, who's that? Uh, the, I mean, I have very little perspective, you know. Right. Sure. Sure. <laughs> um, whatever happened to uh, Keith Clark? I don't know. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> you guys did what? Three albums together? Yeah. No. You and know, you uh, album. I think that Keith's tax business got in the way of of us touring in the springtime, and I don't think that. The other Keith in the band was too thrilled about that. Gotcha. Okay. All right. <laughs> you guys really seemed to gel very well the times I saw you. And uh, yeah, you know, he, he seemed. Well, I, I had no problems with Keith Clark and, and his, his drumming. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he sounded good. And the times I saw you, uh, you know, uh, every time I saw you, you guys never disappointed. That was why you're one of my favorite live bands to go see you know well thanks yeah he had a lot of imagery he's made a lot of great faces and would twirl his sticks and playing those like little uh bi bicycle shorts and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. <laughs> it was almost he came from like the uh, henry rollins school yeah. of shorts you know <laughs> yeah i don't know what his deal was with that but you know god bless him yeah <laughs> um i saw you guys many times at city gardens in trenton new jersey that was my home so that's where well no disrespect to keith clark but uh the band sounds better than it has since i've been in the band oh, um nice. with with joey playing drums awesome i can't wait i can't wait till april uh i will be uh front and center in front of you and uh i can't wait man i'm so excited well, you're in for a real treat i i think that uh joey uh, replaced Ch chuck biscuits and and danzig you know what i mean and he's from the school of chuck biscuits and chuck biscuits i think was aside from lucky one of the the best drummers and in, in the circle jerks yeah so i think that uh joey pays a lot of respect to to lucky and a lot of respect to Chuck's point. chuck right. okay <clears throat> and he's got the pedigree and uh he's uh he's He's well-oiled. Uh, he's a well-oiled machine because he's been consistently touring professionally and playing. So he's in great shape and you're going to be in for a real trade. Awesome, man. 
when you joined, was Lucky still the drummer? No, Keith Clark was the drummer. Drum. Okay, so so because um, I know Lucky is, I mean, people have talked about his playing. I mean, the the, the speed, you know, the precision, yeah. and you know his background in jazz. They they say kind of led you know led to that. You know. Yeah, and I think that you know, it, in all honesty if Lucky would have consistently played the drums instead of, I don't know what he did, sell eyeglasses or, you know, do something with his time where, you know, the drums are not like a bicycle. I mean, you know, you have to like play consistently to, to have your chops up. And so uh, for all the people that complain that it, it should have been Lucky, well, that's that's lucky's fault for not like continuing to you know to play the drums every day right uh, yeah that's a, that's an important part you got to keep it up mm -hmm. absolutely yeah so awesome um well i listen Xander, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on board with us today and uh letting us uh kind of dive right into the the life of xander um, oh, thanks, man. Really well, let your listeners know and, and keep an eye out for my uh, solo debut album. March 5th. Song about songs. Right. March 5th? March 4th. March You're 4th. day late. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Story of my life. Sold out. Story of my sold life. Out, John. <laughs> if I see those orders coming out on March 5th, I'm going to blame you for it. <laughs> Story of my life. What can I do? Album sales are not where they short. should be. Yeah. <laughs> Just listen, John. <laughs> a, my wife says it all the time. I, I don't know why. I can't. Uh, I can't put the. Why don't you listen to me? <laughs> no, John. The, the album is called Song About Songs. Okay. Song about songs. <laughs> it is due out March fourth on Blind Owl Records. All right. Streaming. You can pre-order vinyl probably before that. Please go to YouTube. Check out my singles that are out there right now. I'm about to uh, release another video uh, for the song I wrote called I Have Loved the Story of My Life. There's puppets in it. So get ready to see uh, puppets uh, reenacting a lot of the things that we just talked about. Awesome. Uh, very, very excited about this. Very cool and uh yeah and uh i'll see you in april in in asbury park so pony okay yes all right xander thank you again so much man be good and uh be safe thank you so much guys all right thank you, Xander. appreciate you. it all right bye